We live in a world ruled by tyranny, where knowledge is suppressed and ignorance is glorified. A world where propaganda and misinformation travel the airways at the speed of lies. But in the midst of the violence and chaos, a great awakening is taking place. And as the media empires continue to collapse, a new network is forming. A network of truth. A network of courage. A network of awareness. Peace and greetings. You are now tuned into the Network of Awareness podcast radio station, where we examine current events, politics, health, finance, and topics of cultural relevance in America and throughout the world, while bringing you insightful interviews with guests that will both educate and inspire you. And now, your host of the Network of Awareness podcast radio station, Aura the Full of awareness and gifts like Aura, the informational list. Peace and greetings, brothers and sisters from around the world. This is Or the Informationalist, and you're now tuned in to a live broadcast of the Network of Awareness. And I got a great show for you today on this Righteous Tightrope Tuesday. And we got a righteous brother, a man of the Most High, a man who is very well versed and has a ton of experience in marketing. And we're gonna discuss finances today, as well as the title of the episode that he chose, which is the world economic systems are rooted in wickedness. So I'm gonna bring another brother from the BOCC by the name of Tasir, and uh, we're gonna talk about this. All right, Tasir is actually an entrepreneur, owns his own business. Uh, he's a man of statistics, data, so he's going to give a wealth of information that I hope is going to bring many of you brothers and sisters that also have these concerns about our economic systems of the world some great um, edification and some great substance and things to be aware of because that's what we do here at the Network of Awareness. So in just a moment... We're going to bring Brother Tassir on the show, and uh, we're going to get this started off right, shall we? My aura is a network full of awareness and gifts like aura, the informational list. All right, peace and greetings, people. Welcome to the Network of Awareness. I'm Or the Informationalist. And uh, today's episode, The World Economic Systems Are Rooted in uh, Wickedness. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Brother Tassir. Welcome, Shalom, brother. Peace and blessings to you. Brother, thank you. Thank you for the <clears throat> fine, fine uh, intro. Greatly appreciated. Most high in Christ bless you. And thank you for inviting me to participate on the show. Um, love the topic. So I, I can't take credit for the topic uh, completely because I think it was a collaboration between you and I. So, uh, and if the previous conversations we've had about this topic uh, as any indication, then I think your audience will be in for a real informational treat. Well, you are entrepreneur um, and um, 
We'll talk a little bit about your business uh, towards the end of the broadcast, but what compelled you spiritually? Because we're going to bring out some scriptures today, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. What compelled you spiritually to want to discuss this topic of how our economic systems of the world are rooted in wickedness? Yeah. And brother, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and so, you know, if I'm, I'm going to take a step back a little bit and uh, start with uh, a foundational issue, which many of us in this faith should be aware of and should understand. And so um, when I started pursuing the truth of the scriptures, and as other people would say, you know, you started getting into this truth and that truth of the scriptures is what does the most high say through his prophets? What does the most high say through his son? And what does the most high say through the apostles? Um, and so that is the truth of the scriptures, the old and new Testament, they work in unison. There is no discrepancy as much of the world will say, they'll say that the old Testament is this, but the new Testament changed everything. It, it didn't because the new Testament writers, inclu including Christ himself, refer to the old Testament scriptures and what the, um, and what the prophets wrote, which of course was inspired by the most high. And so. Pursuing that truth is an affront to your paradigm. Okay, so everybody's got a paradigm, right? That they've got a truth that they hold on to for dear life. And a lot of times their psyche and their their mental health depends on holding on to that paradigm. But you know, the most high came and said, You you must be born again. And being born again means you've got to abandon those old man-made traditional truths that we've held on to, and you've got to see the truth of the scriptures and what he says and what his son says and follow that and implement that. And so that's an affront to a lot of people. And so as I discovered the truth of the scriptures, and I, I've always said that um, I want the truth. I don't want to be right. I want the truth. And so a lot of people will see that as you, you're just trying to be right. You just always want to say, no, I don't want to be right. There may be times that I'm wrong, but if the scriptures say this, that's what I want. I want what the scriptures say. And so that starts to permeate that mindset of the willingness to abandon your paradigm and to see what the most high has in store for us, which to a lot of people is very scary because then you have to trust the most high, right? And a lot of people don't want to trust the most high. But in order to do that, you've got to abandon your paradigm. And even though I'm an entrepreneur, you know, I've had a couple of different businesses and I, I've always said that entrepreneurs have an entrepreneurial spirit. Not that that's a bad thing, but it just means that there is an adventure in your mind that you want to pursue and that you sometimes end up pursuing, even though you have to abandon the safety and the security of a quote unquote job. And so with that in mind, pursuing the, the truth of the scriptures, I guess I've always had that um, desire to let's get out of this quote unquote matrix and let's see what the truth is. And so that's, that's helped me in business in order to start a business. And I look back on the first business I started back in the early two thousands. I'm like, I gotta be, I have to be crazy. I willingly left the good job and um, you know, taking care of, you know, my household, you know, my spouse and spouse wasn't working. I left a good job to start a business and the most high just blessed it right out the gate. And so as I think about that, I also think about the economic system that I operate in, which happens to be a quasi capitalism. And I'll, I'll talk about that later, but a quasi capitalism where, you know, anybody can, uh, and we don't have caste systems here. Uh, in the West and pr particularly in America. So if you grow up poor, you can actually end up being very wealthy, you know, based on an idea or um, a risk that you take. And so to, to a great degree, that kind of mindset is also congruent with how people approach the scriptures in terms of you got to abandon your old paradigm and embrace the truth of the scriptures. Similarly, entrepreneurs have to abandon the safety of what they've known in terms of a job, benefits, retirement, et cetera. And they go and venture out on their own and they make their way in this current economic system, which can be very scary. But to a lot of entrepreneurs, 
it's extremely rewarding for a number of different reasons from, you know, you get to be your own boss. You are the quote unquote captain of your own fate. But oddly enough, most entrepreneurs and most businesses that are started actually fail. And, you know, that's, that's something that entrepreneurs have to ignore in order to move forward. And there are times that I've looked back and said, I can't believe I did that because if I had what if I'd been in a place where I'm constantly worrying about it, I probably wouldn't have moved forward. I probably wouldn't have done it. So, but it's interesting that the way I operate and a lot of other entrepreneurs operate in this current economic system in the West, in this quasi capitalism is, um, is interesting because again, capitalism is people think capitalism is a godsend and it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but it's actually not. No, no economic system is, but because I'm in this economic system and if I had to choose, I'd probably choose this one over communism, um, because of that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, but you know, that's, that's sort of how I, I marry the two and how I sort of started looking at opportunities in that in the same way that the most high was there with David when he took on Goliath, I look at it the same way with entrepreneurs, especially those entrepreneurs who are in the faith that there, there are a bunch of Goliaths out here and leaving your job. And even if you hold on to your job and you start another company or start another, um, some kind of initiative, that's still scary because there's no guarantee that you're going to be successful. So you have to put your trust and your faith in the most high. And there will be times when it's very scary. Sometimes you think, how am I going to pay the mortgage next month? Or how am I going to bring in income? How am I going to do this? And you have to rely on the most high. And there are times when I've done that. I've asked those questions and I've relied on the most high. And he has never once over the last, uh, let's see, almost eight years that I started this company, he's, he's never abandoned me. So That's right. um, so yeah, it's, it's a connection, definitely. Yeah, the most high definitely provides what you need. Um, I, you know, this podcast is an entrepreneurial, uh, venture for me because this mm -hmm. is my business and, uh, it's something that I'm working on building and I've had a lot of failure with it in regards to, uh, certain goals that I'm trying to meet. Um, a lot of it is based on my content. I just, I think I chose probably one of the worst times to bring out information that's contradictory mm -hmm. to, or would be considered opposing to the agenda, the satanic agenda. Mm -hmm. um, but it is what it is. And speaking of that, um, what do you think about resilience, resiliency when it comes to entrepreneurialism? Because you mentioned something about failure, and I know I've mm -hmm. experienced a fair amount of it. And if you, if you read the scriptures, which is the best personal development book ever written, mm -hmm but also personal development books that have been written by authors. Uh, right. Resiliency is key because uh, failure is temporary. If yeah. you choose to perceive it that way, yeah. it can be permanent though. If you choose to perceive it as finite and like final, like it's mm -hmm. like, Oh, I messed up. It's over, <laughs> you know? And those are the people right. that usually fail because if you right. study certain entrepreneurs, um, you'll see that a lot of them didn't actually have success until five, sometimes 10. I mean, there's entrepreneurs that don't make a breakthrough until after 20 years of doing what they've been doing for 20 years. And then boom, right. just everything becomes viral and change their world changes in a blink of an eye. So you right. can you talk about that, about being resilient, especially in your faith to make sure that the faith is that the most high is the the primary force that works within your decision making and actions when pursuing business ventures? Yeah, absolutely, bro. And that's that's a good question. So I, I'm going to start off with Jeremiah 17 in verses five and six. And so this is one of my favorite scriptures because it's it's really helped to sustain me over the years, not just in business, but in in everything else. So you know, Jeremiah writes, thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabit it. And so there are a couple of things here. One is um, 
trusting in yourself, trusting in man. Now, we're in a particular situation where we are the children of the most high, not because of skin color, not because of, um, you know, anything else, but because we have heard the shepherd's voice and responded accordingly. And so, and that, you know, there, there are people who could be blue eyed, um, blonde hair people, people who are Asian, people who are, who look like they are Hamites or what have you. And if they hear the shepherd's voice, then obviously the most high says that they are in line with being Israel because they've heard the shepherd's voice, their name was written in the book, et cetera. And so this trusting in man, we have a particular situation with us being the children of the most high that we can't go around trusting in ourselves and building things and trusting in our own hands and our own works because we are his children and we're his adopted sons and daughters. We are held to a particular uh, criteria and a particular standard. So things that we try to do on our own, they're not going to pan out for the most part because we're still under these curses, right? From Deuteronomy 28. So because of that, we have to rely on the most high. When we rely on the most high, he will, and according to his will, he's going to guide us and bless us. And that's his promise to his people. And so we can't depart and our hearts can't depart from the Lord because if they do, then we are not going to be successful. We may look successful, but we're going to have stuff frustrate us. We're going to run into brick walls. We're going to have failures, et cetera. And we're going to look at the heathen and say, well, why, why can't we be like them? Which, you know, again, the children of Israel did coming out of Egypt. They did that all day long. Why can't we be like the heathen or the rest of the world? So, but that's that, that second verse shall not see good when shall not see when good cometh implies that good is going to come. But if we're not connected to the most high, we're not going to see it, you know, and that tells me, and that suggests to me, that there are oftentimes opportunities that roll around and that come our way. But if we're not in our right mind, if we're not serving the most high, we're going to be blind to it. We're not going to see it. So we may, in retrospect, look and say, we, we don't have, we never got a chance. We never got a break. We don't have any opportunities and it's their fault, you know, but we've abandoned the most high or we're serving the most high the way we want to. And so we're not going to see when good cometh, when those blessings come, because they do come, but the most high will blind us to those things and we won't be able to see it nor take advantage of it. And so we want to be like that tree planted where it's by the water, it's being fed, it's being nourished and it continues to flourish and grow. It may be pruned from time to time, but we want that because, you know, father loves his sons and daughters and will discipline and correct his sons and daughters if he loves them. Right. And so that's what we want to do. We want to trust in the most high and not trust in man. And so for me, for this business, it has been a constant reminder that I need to trust in the most high, because there are things that I endeavor to do with this business. And some things have been successful. Some things have not been successful. And when things were not successful and when you have these, um, what I refer to as micro failures, you know, there's the opportunity to learn from it, to grow from it and to move forward. Sometimes people have these failures, these micro failures, and they seem like, oh my goodness, they're huge failures and they stop and they give up. Okay. So to your point, there are a lot of entrepreneurs that we know of who, uh, whether they are in the faith or not, most of them are not in the faith because if they're not in the faith, we hear about it through magazines and uh, the media, et cetera, you know, we can come up with a number of them, you know, who lead Facebook, Twitter, um, other businesses like, you know, the, the founders of Home Depot from Atlanta. Um, you know, one of them now owns the Falcons and that's that sort of thing. So all these entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley, uh, HP and all these other, you know, Apple, um, Steve Jobs and all these other entrepreneurs they've faced a number of failures before they reach success. And, you know, you'd hate to be the person who is given 15 opportunities, but you quit at the 14th one. And the 15th one is going to be the breakthrough. Okay. And so, and hopefully I'm not sounding like, you know, a, a, a prosperity gospel preacher, but you know, no, there's, a lot of truth, there's a lot of truth to that, that, 
you know, the, 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 the enemy will put so many obstacles in your way just to discourage you. And the most high is like, just trust me, trust me. If this is my will and you've given yourself over to me and you are obeying me, then trust me. And it may be that 15th opportunity or 15th attempt that is the breakthrough, or it may be something completely different that you didn't even think of. And so the same thing with, you know, our, our normal walk in this everyday life on this earth, we run into failure, disappointment all the time. And so we can either um, get upset. We can curse the most high. We can say, you know, forget this. I'm doing my own thing my way. The most high is not helping me. Or we can be like Paul. And so Paul said in, um, let me get that scripture. So in Philippians four, and so starting in verse 11, he says that, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And so he's, he knows how to be both abased and how to abound. Um, and so in, that's another scripture that's encouraging to me because no matter the circumstances, whether you know, you're riding high because you had a great success or if you've had a micro failure, you know, if the most high is in this and you are serving the most high, then it, there's the opportunity to be content in whatever situation you are in. Yes. And every situation is temporary and is seasonal. And so whether it's a failure or whether it's great success, great success is temporary. You know, so we don't see it like that. We see great success as we've made it. That's it. We've reached the end. Not that it's one of many seasons. And so not saying that you're going to be poor per se, but that success is not going to be the, the exactly the same from season to season. And Absolutely. so we, we have the opportunity to put our trust in the most high and to um, deal with failure and micro failures ac according to his scripture, not according to our feelings, not according to what other people are telling us, but according to our faith in him and his promises to us that he would never leave us. You said so much in such a short period of time that matters. Um, so I'm going to try to catch up with you on some mm -hmm. of it because um, I did a show called When It's Bad, It's Still All Good. And that's mm -hmm. pretty much what you're saying because sometimes when things are not working out in our favor from mm -hmm. our perception, and I, and I say ours being the specific word um, where doesn't necessarily mean that it's not. It's just mm -hmm. a process that things have to, you have to go through. And I think a lot of times, and from my own personal experiences, it's because you have to appreciate what it is that you are looking towards for the future and striving for to, mm -hmm. to have in your life. And mm -hmm. a lot of times the most high is going to make sure that if you attain that, that it's not just that you put in the hard work. It's not just that you're resilient, but it's when you get there that you can truly appreciate it for the purpose it's meant to serve spiritually opposed right. to cardinally. Mm -hmm. And yep. especially if you're rooted in the word, if you're rooted and have a relationship with the most high, that usually happens. That's how mm -hmm. it's revealed to you. Um, yep. So I like how you said uh, micro failures because mm -hmm. it is a microcosm to the experience of your life. And it's just a part of the process. Um, yep. Something else you mentioned too, about how people want to do things their way. I was mm -hmm. one of them. I thought I was the most last year, especially <laughs> the beginning of last year. I thought I was probably the most righteous man that was walking on the face of the planet. Mm. And uh, the most high gave me a big wake up call. Like you got demons all around you and you don't even mm -hmm. know it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I got woken up to that reality real quick. And yeah. it, it really humbled me to yeah. where I started realizing I can't, I can't do this my way. You know, I can't think that everything I'm doing is right. If I'm doing it my way, it's got to be the most highest way. And when you start doing things the most highest way, it's going to be very uncomfortable for that ego. Very yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. And Absolutely. Uh, the ego is always going to fight to the very death to defend itself. Mm -hmm. Now, with that being said, you know, we have the World Economic Forum that mm -hmm. just recently passed. 
Yeah. When these meetings are held, so when you talk about wickedness, because you can't get any more wicked than the people that are in that room. Um, mm -hmm. So you got Charles Schwab. <laughs> or what's his name? Is his name Charles Schwab? Or is it uh, Carl Schwab or something like I that? I think it's Carl Schwab. Carl, Carl Schwab. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the man that talks like a Nazi. And he's, you know, he's like, <laughs> hell Hitler. Why. You know, we're going to have a great reset and everybody's going to love it. You will have mm -hmm. nothing and we'll be happy. But yeah. this guy, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. His name is Klaus Schwab. There we go. Klaus. I, I get it mixed up sometimes. Me too, too. too. Like, and I'm just like, whatever. You know, I just look at him as another demon. You know, that's mm -hmm. how I look at yeah. him. That's just another demon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but. With this new world order B system, and I'm going to make sure I word this properly because this is going to YouTube. So, you know, mm -hmm. that I have to make sure that I use the language properly just because of the level of censorship. But when it comes right. to this mm -hmm. one world order system and people like Klaus Schwab, where now they're, they're putting these systems in place to mm -hmm. create a digital currency system, which mm -hmm. as the scriptures talks about that B system, that mark, a lot mm -hmm. of it has to do with the currency because yeah. in order to buy or sell things in the this one world order B system, you're going to yeah. have to submit yourself to Satan in order to operate in this manner. So I wanted to get... Um, some of your thoughts on how the world is now transitioning to this. Now, we've been in a digital currency, to, so to speak, even though we're dealing with cash, fiat money and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Everything is pretty much digital. I mean, you have debit cards, uh, credit cards, and uh, that's pretty much the way people exchange currency. You still got your Chinese restaurants and your local stores that won't accept cards <laughs> for a number of yeah, reasons. Right. Because right. I go to this Cuban spot. The lady doesn't do credit cards or debit to this day. Okay. So if you yep. want to buy anything from her, it's got to be cash. Yeah. And, and that, um, you know, taking credit cards and debit cards, I mean, that can be expensive for businesses because there are fees associated with that. Yeah. Also. So but I, a lot I of times it's because they got bad credit or they did something, uh, yeah. you know, shady. Yeah. Yeah. But um, well, I want to get your thoughts on this crypto, digital, Bitcoin currency that they're now trying to transition because that's ultimately what this supposed alleged great reset is going to be, where they're going to wipe out all the economies. We're already mm -hmm. seeing it with Bank of America. Have you saw that mm -hmm. video uh, that's viral on um, social media where people... We're going to take out money out of their bank accounts, and their 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 bank accounts are all dried up, zero. Uh, and, no, in I Bank America. Yeah. No, I haven't. I may have seen something like that, uh, and I come across a lot of stuff. So I think I may have seen that in a couple of instances with uh, at a couple of branches. I'm not exactly sure what cities that occurred, but you know, you you bring up something very interesting because if people have been paying attention. You, you, we, we saw that already happen in Europe, and I'll give you an example. So Greece has been, you know, a few years ago they've had all these loans from the European Union that they had to pay back, and then they had to implement these austerity programs. Which part of that said that well, the banks get to take some of your money in order to pay these these loans that Greece has agreed to take from the European Union. And so basically that's like, if, if we were here in this country and they were doing that, they'd say, Hey, if you've got a thousand dollars in the bank, we're going to take a hundred dollars that, but why? Well, we had, we're in so much debt that we have to pay the debt off. So we're just going to take it. All right. So that's been happening for the last few years. Now it hasn't really happened here like that, but when it starts happening other places, you can't think that it won't happen here because again, these people that are um, currently in places of power within this country. And we know that, you know, that it could be Congress, it could be um, executives at, you know, 
corporations. It could be board members of corporations. It, it could be anyone, people who are in power. Um, and, and there's a, there's a connection with all this stuff. And so I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but, um, that's been happening to get back to your specific point. That's been happening for years now. Okay. And this, the new world order has been in place and we've, the foundations have already been set. So we may think, or some of us may think, well, the new world order is coming. The new, really the new world order was here thousands of years ago. <laughs> okay. So, but, and everything is cyclical. Okay. So everything is cyclical. So we've seen, if we were living back in 1941 and all of a sudden the U S is, is pulled into uh, world war II, um, supposedly by surprise, quote unquote, um, we would, a lot of us would think, oh, this is the end of the world because the whole world is in war and how can we all survive this? But things are cyclical and, you know, there are periods where there's great peace and there are periods where there's great war. There's, there are periods where there's great abundance and there are periods where there's great famine. Okay. And so we don't know which sick, which cycle we're in. We don't know if, even though we know and understand from scriptures, we're in the latter days. We don't know which cycle we're in, in terms of this is the last cycle before Christ comes back. We, we don't know that because Christ doesn't know when he's going to come back. Only the most high knows that. So we don't know that. And it's easy to be fearful of that. Okay. And so we, the believers, well, well the heathen's going to act accordingly. They're going to put their faith and their trust in man. Okay. In, in science, in government, et cetera. Disciples of Christ, we have to put our trust in the most high through Christ. And Christ said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you as he's talking to his disciples and his disciples are asking, you know, what is it going to be like at the, you know, at the end of the time? And so Christ is explaining this and he's explaining this, that he might give us peace. And then he says in the world, you have, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so if we put our trust in the world, we're going to be fearful. But if we put our trust in the most high, we have nothing to fear regarding this stuff. They, and, and my, my position is, even though, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I have a business, I'm trying to make it grow, et cetera. But the world lieth in wickedness. Let them do what they're going to do. You know, our job and our responsibility is not to stop wickedness per se like that, not to stop the new world order. That's not our role. Our role is to bring men and women to repentance. Those men and those women who have heard the shepherd's voice, whose, whose names are written in the book of life, that they, but they may be currently lost or unaware. And so we have to be those workers because the, um, because the harvest is, is white, right? And so we have to talk to anybody who will listen that this is what the Most High says through his son Christ, and this is the path to salvation, and that's, um, repentance and that's keeping the commandments. And so there's nothing in scripture where Christ or the most high through his prophets or the apostles said, Hey, you know, there's going to be a new world order and it's going to impact, uh, the economies. And this is how you should handle your money per se. I mean, that's not in scripture, but what is in scripture is as we read in Jeremiah, cursed is the man who trusts in man, but we have to trust in the most high. And so the, the, the short answer, and I appreciate you letting me go on about this, but the short answer is let them do what they're going to do. They're going to do what they want to do anyway, because they're controlled by the enemy. And we know that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Fine. We understand that. That's the world we live in. Okay. Our role is to make sure that we are connected to the most high through his son. And so that's our salvation. That's our focus. Let them do what they're going to do. If we really believe and trust in the most high, he's going to do what he promised to do to take care of us. And I personally think the most high knows what he's doing. And so again, it's let them do whatever they're going to do. So be it. They have no control over what the most high is going to do. And he's going to do what he's going to do and what he promised. Yeah. Well said, especially about how, you know, I've, I talk a lot about how we're not really here to change the world. I used to believe that. I think we're here to yeah. just make a difference in in setting the example of just like how the Messiah set an example of how you have to live your mm -hmm. life in order to get to salvation. 
All right. Exactly. That's why he is the way, the life to that salvation, which is the most high. And mm-hmm. that's where we come from. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of that these days. And speaking of um, the New World Order that you said st- started mm-hmm. centuries ago, mm-hmm. um, we saw, um, as far as with, the, with this country, when it comes to New World Order, the Great Depression. That's yeah. when a lot of it started where gold and silver just completely got wiped out of people's bank accounts. You had a lot of men and women during those times jumping off mm-hmm. of buildings, more men. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. They were committing suicide left and right. Yeah. And um, I truly believe that's going to happen again on mm-hmm. but the whole different scale. Mm-hmm. Um, recently on January 10th, uh, the uh, Biden along with Librador and Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Trudeau, Mm -hmm. signed a declaration for the North American Union. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a big step because uh, Mm -hmm. this is something that's been in the works for a long time, long time. Mm -hmm. And now it's finally here. So what they're looking to do is create now the North American Union. Mm -hmm. And uh, what originally, when I talked about this back in 2006 and 7, they talked about the Amero being the new mm-hmm. form of currency for the North, for North America. Yeah. So what do you think will happen if they're able to execute that, which it looks like that might happen very soon because the yeah. purposes of bringing about the North American union is not just to join Mexico, Canada, and United States as one union. It mm-hmm. also does away with the constitution. Constitution mm-hmm. means nothing. I don't think the constitution really meant anything anyway for our people, but <laughs> Um, it it does away with that. But what it also yeah. does is that it brings the initiative to to mandate the science appliance, aka mm-hmm. the satanic serum, mm-hmm. to to be mandated for everybody as a yeah. global mandate mm-hmm. that everybody has to supposedly abide by. Yeah. So what do you think will happen if they start introducing this new currency called the Amero? for North America? Yeah, so again, that's been in the works. Um, I remember when I was young, a young adult, and Ross Perot was running for president, which I personally think he was compromised near the end because he quit and then he jumped back in. <laughs> you know, supposedly he quit because they were going to make a mockery of his daughter's wedding, which that's no reason to quit a presidential race. But anyway, that's another conversation. Um, but he said, you know, if, if we have the North American, if we have NAFTA, you're going to hear the big sucking sound of jobs going down to Mexico. And lo and behold, that's what happened. And so th- there's, there's, a th- there's an economic theory that says that you've got first, second, and third world countries. Okay. And so when you have advanced first world countries like the United States, like Great Britain, et cetera, we then become primarily consumers because our cost of living is so high. We don't really make anything anymore. We just want to consume, 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 basically be entertained. And so then you transition manufacturing jobs, as an example, to third world countries like Mexico, like um, China, et cetera. And so there's, a, there's this theory that suggests that by the time you become a first world country, it's too late. You can't manufacture, manufacture anything. Well, that's that's a lie from the pit of hell. Um, that's an economic system that is perpetuated to make sure that countries like the United States, um, whether it's sending jobs to Mexico or to China, that you can't make anything anymore because the cost of living is too high. And we saw in the previous administration, well, you can still make things here, you know, which is one of the reasons why he was you know, so demonized is that he's trying to bring. And I'm not saying that everybody should be a, a Trump fan or anything remotely close to that because it's all wicked. Okay. But proving that that economic system where first, second, and third world countries, it rotates in terms of production, always to the lowest common denominator of the third world country. That's, that's manufactured too, for, you know, pun intended, um, because inflation and purely inflation, which is, uh, which is a man-made construct inflates, um, costs here in a first world country. Okay. And we've seen that in the last couple of years that things have jumped in price by anywhere from 30% to 200, 300%. Okay. And so that's partially because of the 
banking system that we have here too. I'm not going to get completely into that, but you know, most countries have a particular kind of banking system where things are quote unquote centralized, if you know what I mean. And so all of that stuff is, has been created to suggest that, Hey, we can control the economy. We can avoid recessions and depressions. Okay. But most um, depressions and recessions are manufactured and created. Great Depression, for example. He had a um, Republican in the White House at the start of the Great Depression, and his position was, let this take care of itself, and it will take care of itself, okay? But the reason why there was a Great Depression is, obviously, we had, you know, the centralized banking system, which, you know, they manufacture and manipulate interest rates. And so you can make loans and money available to everyone fairly liberally, or you can constrict it. And when you start restricting it severely, then you retard and halt economic development. Okay. And so that's all manufactured. That's all man-made. All right. So then we get another president in Roosevelt in office and he starts, you know, this, these great works and the government intervening and saying, Hey, we're going to, we're going to let the government get us out of this recession and, or this depression. And the, the country was still in the depression or the last, perhaps the tail end of the depression when world war two started. But oddly enough, a country like the UK, they came out of the, out of the depression fairly quickly because they let the economy work itself out, which it did. So they didn't have the same depression impact or the impact of the depression like we did here because we let government go in and try to fix it, which that's never a good idea. Okay. So fast forward to 2007, 2008 with the great recession. Again, it's, it's another issue of you have banks that are packaging these, um, mortgage loans into derivatives, and then you have them making derivatives of derivatives, okay, which supposedly was illegal, but nobody went to jail. Um, and so when those things started to fail, then you had the banks restricting lending, okay, so putting a restraint on the money supply. And so that just was a, um, that was a ripple effect that went through the entire economy around the entire world. And it wasn't just the U.S., but you know, a lot of stuff happened here that really impacted a lot of citizens in the United States. So you have these banking systems that are manipulating the economies and restricting and loosening cash flow, basically. And when that happens, that's going to have a direct impact on the economy. And supposedly these central banking systems were put in place so that we wouldn't have recessions and depressions. Well, how many recessions and depressions have we had? We've had quite a few of them since the central, the central banking system was put into place. And so that's untrue that they're in place for our protection, et cetera. But anyway, again, this world is what it is. And, you know, to your point or to your, your comment about the depression and people jumping out of windows, you're likely going to see that again, especially if the recession is worse than the one in 2008. Okay. So it's so critically important for us to be plugged into the most high. The most high is our resource and our strong tower. Man, banking systems, money, that's not it. So the most high will protect his people. Those people that are called by his name, those of us who are being obedient, keeping the commandments, examining ourselves to remove the leaven from our lives, from our minds, the most high is going to protect us. And so I, I think about the, I think about Israel and Egypt, right? When all the plagues are coming on Egypt and Israel is just watching, you know, it's like, it's almost like they're in the stands eating their popcorn, watching this happen to, to Egypt. Brother, didn't so, that kind of recently just happen with the science appliance? The science appliance. It, it, explain that to me a little bit because you probably, you may know more about that than I do. No, I just mean the, didn't that just recently just happen when people decided to take that satanic serum? And oh, Israel oh, was just, oh, yeah. that's the science appliance. I know you don't know what that means, but <laughs> that the science I, I appliance, that term, so. yeah, mm -hmm. that's the science appliance. We don't say the V word here, but um, gotcha. Gotcha. that's, that's blasphemous to say that word here. Um, <laughs> Barely. Barely, right? <laughs> but uh, that kind of happened with that yeah. where 
we, you know, and and I'm going to say that those who didn't t- decided not to trust in man were just standing by watching yep. the the horror, you know, and the destruction come upon people that yep. decided to do that. So that's all I want to yep. say, brother. Continue. No, no, you're right. And thank you for for prompting me, uh, because um, now that I know what you're talking about, because I haven't used that term myself, but I understand the restrictions. Okay, so that thing that you're referring to, um, there are a couple of interesting things that have come about because of that. And so you're right. That's that's a good example of this world system saying, hey, we want you to do this and this and this. And some people saying, oh, okay, willingly. And other people saying, you got to be kidding me. You you don't have a track. The government doesn't have a track record of protecting and looking out for the welfare of its citizens for the most part. I mean, they and and, and most governments are ill-equipped to actually manage anything properly. You know, yeah. the, the government through the military is great at killing people and breaking things. But the government in and of itself, if you want something to work as inefficiently as possible, get the government involved. OK, so all the time, all the time. And so this thing that you were referring to. There are some interesting components to it. One is um, now we're seeing some of the repercussions of it now with people just falling out. Okay. And so now it's funny to read articles that say, well, you know, people are, people are keeling over suddenly because of the, <laughs> of the criticisms from those who didn't adhere to that offering. I got a great one. I got a great one for you, Ernie. If you leave your TV on at night while you sleep, that's Mm -hmm. what's causing a lot of people to die suddenly. Oh my goodness. (laughs) That (laughs) is... How long have people been doing that since TV was... But that is something that is now legitimately put into uh, documentation by doctors saying that Leaving your TV on at night can cause, you know, over time can cause you to, you know, have the probability of passing away suddenly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's any old excuse, but we know what the real issue is. So but the other thing, which I think is very interesting. And this goes down to, you know, so when when Satan tempted Eve, Satan didn't make Eve do anything. Eve did what she did because, and by extension, Adam did what he did because they, they wanted to for ver- right. various reasons. They have various motivations. No one at this point has held anybody down and made them take that. Okay. People have volunteered. Now, through coercion, it's true. It's been through coercion. You're going to lose this. You're going to lose that. You won't be able to do this, that, and the other. And so, but no one has come through, and not in this country, maybe over in China or some other places, but. In this country, that hasn't happened yet. And there's a reason why that hasn't happened. It's because the enemy wants you to choose to do things. Okay. Right. The enemy's not going to make you do things. The enemy can't make you do things. Okay. So it's up to you and your lusts. And if you've given over to your, if you're given over to your lust, then you're going to choose that all the time. But in this country, nobody was forced to take it. People volunteered. Well, people say, well, you know, I would have lost my job if I had taken, if I hadn't taken it. So therefore I went ahead and took it. And that's their choice. And again, if we're connected to the most high and we trust in the most high, then the most high is going to provide for us. Again, most of the world lieth in wickedness and most of the people in this country, even though people claim this is a quote unquote Christian nation, we understand it's not a Christian nation. We understand that it's a religious nation and religion, um, just like With the Pharisees, religion is hypocritical because religion picks and chooses what it wants to adhere to and ignores a lot of other things. Okay, so because people were given a choice and people made their choice, some choices are more difficult than others, granted. Okay, so some people who are entrepreneurs who don't have to worry about losing their jobs are like, I'm not taking that. Okay, so maybe you can't travel outside of the country. So maybe you can't do this. Maybe you can't do that. Maybe you have to wear a mask. Maybe you have to uh, get proof that you are um, C free. Okay, um, which which yeah is fine, and some people have done that. But you are given the choice whether or not you want to take that thing, and it's there's there's no track record of the government or these 
pharmaceutical entities doing things for our benefit. In other words, they're not benevolent towards us. Okay. They are doing things for their own purposes, whether it's to make money, whether it's to bring about specific control, et cetera. And so we, we could go deeper into this, but we probably have to have every other word bleeped out. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's interesting how it's, it's, it was a case of people chose to do it. Okay. And again, everybody's circumstance is different. The people who chose to do it chose to trust in man and were threatened and felt like they had no choice as opposed to, I'm going to rely on the most high. I'm going to fast and pray and I'm going to trust whatever he does. He knows what he's doing. And the most high does know what he's doing. I mean, who's, who's going to counsel the most high, right? He knows exactly what he's doing. And so if we choose to trust him and not trust in man, then he will take care of us as he promised he would. So yeah, it's interesting that, you know, to your point, you know, that's already started with this thing that people want people to take. And there will be other things too. And so Christ says, just hold out to the end, you know, and you'll be saved. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be ongoing. And this is only the first salvo, I think, um, that we've seen. Uh, you know, I'm really enjoying this uh, broadcast because you're bringing a lot of things to light. You're bringing like three episodes that I've done for this season. <laughs> This season is called Great Understandings. And uh, I did mm -hmm. a show called The Lust for Consumption. Mm -hmm. um, I did one called Erroneous Economics. Mm -hmm. um, I've done so many on the Narcissism series. Yeah. And you're bringing a lot of those episodes, the content that I presented all together yeah. in, a, mm -hmm. in a very you know concise summary within this uh, broadcast. So, mm -hmm. and the reason I brought up the the whole science appliance because we don't need to, you know, this is going to YouTube, so we don't need we yeah. don't need no problems. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but uh, the reason I brought it up is because there's nothing new under the sun, and I think mm -hmm. that's one thing the scriptures always um, sheds light on is that everything yeah. that we think we're experiencing, like we're the first to do this, it's like no, right, it's right. been going on for thousands of years. So yep. all these plagues that are now happening, they happened thousands mm -hmm. of years ago. But mm -hmm. those that stay true to the Most High always wind up not having to experience those plagues. Where, mm -hmm. like you said, they just in Egypt, the children of Israel were watching, you know, uh, the Egyptians firstborn get wiped out. Mm -hmm. And those mm -hmm. that had the blood of Christ on their doors... You know, right. at that time. And and that's, you know, for all you people, because I just saw a, a post about how the Torah, you only got to read the Torah and all this other mm. stuff about Christ and Messiah and all that. It, it It's it's not real and this and that. It's like, okay, you know, but that's, mm -hmm. that's for another episode. Um, mm -hmm. But going back to, I mentioned this to you. I said, we're going to talk a little bit about narcissism. Because originally, mm -hmm. you and I were going to do an episode about narcissism in corporate America, which corporate yeah. America really is your finance economic system. I mean, Wall mm -hmm. Street. I mean, if you want to, yeah. if yeah. you if you want to get an education on narcissism, go to Wall Street. Go into a Wall Street mm -hmm. floor, and you will probably get the best yeah. education in narcissism that you can ever get. As far as how, um, there's just a lack of empathy. <laughs> There is no empathy in Wall yeah. Street. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about narcissism because I come from marketing myself in several different industries when it comes to advertising. Mm -hmm. I was in the insurance industry for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And I did well when I wanted to. I'm not going to say that yeah. I was this super huge success because if I was I'd probably still be in it but I did yeah. have and I could have been that guy but I had too much empathy I had too much of a yeah. conscience where it's like yeah. ethically there was only but so far I would go to be unethical there was a lot mm -hmm. of things that I just would never do and right. that sometimes did not make my pockets become fat and mm -hmm. statistically and this is based on psychologists' vast amount of statistics and data and, and study based on research mm -hmm. is that a narcissistic person in America 
is always going to make more money than the person that's not. Sure. Because they lack empathy. And when you lack empathy, yeah. mm-hmm. your drive that, that, you know, they, people say that drive to where they, they want to be successful. They mm-hmm. will step on their mother's back to get to where they need to be. Yeah. So in your experiences, especially in the topic of discussion about how our economic systems are rooted in wickedness, that mm-hmm. wickedness now has a name. It's called yeah. narcissism. <laughs> narcissism is just another name for the evil of how principalities work through us. And that's what people seem to forget is that everything is spiritual. That's why I call the show Network of Awareness, because when you are aware, you start realizing, wait a second, I was created in the image of the Most High. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. The Most High is not a physical being. The Most Mm -hmm. High is that which is and always will be. That's energy. That's spirit. Mm -hmm. So that spirit comes in the form of a light, Mm -hmm. an everlasting light. Yeah. Now, with that light, you realize that everything is spiritual. So these principalities that work through narcissists, and you hear so many stories. I, I saw it within the woman that I was in a relationship with. Um, mm-hmm. Their eyes black out. I mean, they, all, they, they start speaking in different types of tongues and mm-hmm. making different snarly noises. I mean, it's, it's just the list goes on and on. But when yeah. it comes to narcissism and economics um, and how these principalities work through people, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to get your perspective and some of your, you know, you don't have to go in detail about personal experiences or anything, but just give mm-hmm. like an overall review on your experience um, in marketing in corporate mm-hmm. America when it comes to this thing called narcissism, this wickedness, evil behavior that people have been probably doing for, for thousands of years. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that is, that is a completely, <laughs> you could probably do 50 shows about <laughs> you know, the details of that. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting thing. And I'm going to try to dissect it a little bit. So you've got corporate America, which is basically another word for capitalism. Um, and, and I will say this first, and then I'll go into answering your question. You know, so the, the three, pri- and there are multiple economic systems around the world, but the three that people seem to understand or recognizes communism, socialism, and capitalism. Okay. They're all rooted in wickedness. Um, and so communism says, for example, there is no God and all property collectively belongs to everybody, which you still need somebody to administer that. So that's a misnomer that it belongs to everybody because really it's in the, still in the control of a few. Socialism is, well, if there was a God, he wants us to be benevolent, benevolent to everybody all the time in all circumstances, whether people deserve it or not, because we know that if we don't work, we don't eat, right? So, and also under socialism is that the state is full or partial owner of property, all right? Capitalism <laughs> says, wait a minute, wait a minute, there is a God, but he wants us all to be rich. Okay. And the property is to be owned and controlled by the individual and not the state. And some individuals own and control more property than others, even if they have to take it from you. Okay. So, so with all those three man-made economic constructs, you know, looking at narcissism in a capitalist economic culture, um, I'll tell you what I, what I have experienced and I, I'll tell you what I've observed. And so, well, I'll start with what I've observed first. So I've observed that um, this country and this economic system loves the narcissist, loves the narcissist. And that that's in politics and that's in, in other areas of society too. But in business, they love the narcissist. And so the narcissist is primarily focused on him or herself and has a personality where there is the cult of personality where people will say, oh, this person is great or wonderful because of their skills or their ability to do X, Y, Z. And that person will say, yep, I agree with you. That's why I'm great. Okay. And so (laughs) they are captains of industry. They lead organizations. Everybody wants to know their thoughts or their opinions about a number of different things, et cetera. And they willingly, willingly pontificate on everything under the sun. 
even to the point where you have people who were tech entrepreneurs now getting into health science, okay, which they have no business in health science. Oh, yeah. And especially if they are adherents to eugenics, they're all involved in health science because they're eugenicists. Okay. That's so, right. But you have people who, and then you have people who look up to these people who also want to emulate them. So yes. people who are climbing, quote unquote, climbing the ladder, they want to emulate the narcissist. I've heard so many people, and you can look at uh, the woman who just got sentenced, who uh, was the CEO of uh, Theranos, who, um, you know, they had, she supposedly had this technology that you can do, a, you can take a drop of blood and do all these different kind of blood tests. And it was a farce. There was no technology. There was no real patent. And so her, her, um, her mentor, even though she, I don't think she ever met him, but her focus was on, she wanted to be the next Steve Jobs. Okay. She dressed like Steve Jobs. She um, artificially lowered her voice to be taken more seriously as a woman, et cetera. Oh, and this man. woman was a narcissist. If you looked up the term narcissist in the dictionary, you'd probably find her picture. Um, but there was a, there was a mini series on Hulu about her, which was actually entertaining. And so what's it called? It's uh, well, her name is, Oh my goodness. Uh, let's see. Her name is, is it Arias? Um, no, it's, um, the name of the company that she founded was Theranos and her name is Elizabeth Holmes. Oh, and, I got to check that out. I, 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 yeah. yeah. Cause I have Hulu. I have Hulu. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, the, the name of the show on Hulu, and I'm trying to, I just watched it uh, maybe six months ago. Um, let's see, I'll find it real quick. But, I'll, but as I find it, I'll, I'll tell you, again, I'll continue the, the, the observation. So people like her and others, um, they are narcissists. Um, and it's about them and it's about their prowess. Now, granted, there are some people in the world who are what I would refer to as savants. Okay. They are for whatever reason, the most high has given them brilliance and talent, whether they are serving him or not. And you could look at a number of different music artists who are uber talented. And a lot of them have sold their soul. And so they've taken that talent that the most high allowed them to have. And they've gone over to the dark side to perpetuate that talent. Okay. And so th those people are narcissists too. Um, but, um, yeah. Uh, I E yay now called yay West. <laughs> he's, he's narcissism on steroids, but and listen, yeah. any, uh, um, I mean, to see uh, any, anybody that I come across that talks mm -hmm. in third person, mm -hmm. that'd be the last and first conversation I have with them. <laughs> it's funny um, how people do that. Yeah, I have like, I have no patience for that. If I hear you talking in third person, I'm like, oh, we're done. Like I'm gonna yeah. do it respectfully, but I'm not gonna have a second conversation with you. Yeah, I'm just yeah, not. I, I have a person. There's a person that I know who refers to themselves in the third person, and this person struggles with always having the focus on themselves, even when it comes to the Most High. And this person struggles with abandoning their position in terms of having a preference for the most high, whatever the most high's will is for that person is they try to oftentimes manipulate what they want and say, well, the most high really wants this for me because I want it, you know? And so they, they struggle. It's almost to the point where it's like cognitive dissonance to say, it's not about you. It's about you and us serving the most high. And it's, it's hard for people to take themselves out of the equation and not focus on themselves. Uh, and, and that show on Hulu is called The Dropout. So it's it's really, it's a, like a mini series and it's really very fascinating. Um, so, but going back to narcissists in corporate America. So you have all these people who not only are narcissists and it's all about me, you have people that aspire to be like them. And I've met very few people who are in leadership positions I can probably count them on three fingers who are not narcissists, who are open, who are benevolent, who are charitable, who are good people. You want to sit around and talk to them because they're just 
b- basically good people. They're not the definition of a pure narcissist. Um, and so I've met a couple of people and worked for a couple of different CEOs who were not narcissists. And they're a pleasure to be around. They may not be serving the most high, but they're certainly, they don't appear to be wicked as all hell. And you know, it's all about them and their ego and their success, et cetera. But most people, as a matter of fact, I had, there were, I worked for a company where the CEO came in after I had started. Great guy. Got along well with him. We talked about everything from music to um, sports to a few other things. And he was a down to earth person. Very, very good at his job. Very good at being the CEO. Got along great. And so there was a transition. A new CEO came in. Complete narcissist. Often talked about his greatness. (laughs) And there was something spiritual about there was something spiritual between us. Not that we were close or we spent a lot of time together, but there was some, I, sometimes I can pick up when people don't like me. And oftentimes it's a spiritual issue and I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm doing, I'm going about my business, doing my job, but the way people are constituted spiritually, sometimes it doesn't jive with my spirit. And oftentimes, and I'll story say story of my way. life, brother. Story of yeah, my life. And, and that happens. I, I notice it happens a lot with women who like other women with me. So if I come across a woman who loves other women, there seems to be a spiritual d- divide and some gap where they have they for whatever reason don't like me. And I think it's maybe the spirit on me and the spirit on them. And, and they the don't want you taking happened. their women either. <laughs> Because <laughs> I've had situations like that where the, where the, uh, I don't even know if I say the word, but where that masculine female, um, yeah. is is like, you know, sizing me up, mm-hmm. like, like yeah. I will wreck you if you come near my mine, me and mine. Well, yeah, and there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of backstabbing, and um, there's a lot of chaos that goes on in corporate America, oftentimes with people who are narcissists who have the spirit on them and narcissists don't have to be CEOs or executives. They're right. sometimes your everyday coworker. And I've had people purposefully try to trip me up and trap me in things where they are trying to get to me. They're trying to do things to me. And it's not at, at every turn. It's just, there are times when I notice it happening and given all praises to the most high, he's given me the ability to be able to see oftentimes what's going on because sometimes the enemy shows his hand. And when that happens, you're like, oh, okay, that's what's going on. All right. So I, I can see that. I can see that's in what's going on. I'm not going to take it personally. I'm just going to stay connected to the most high. The most high is going to fight my battles for me. Okay. So I don't have to do anything. And every time that's happened, and I think there was a class a while ago talking about when quote unquote, the heathen tries to mess with someone who's a disciple of Christ and that heathen pays the price. There have been times when people have tried to mess with me and to varying degrees of success. And they have shortly after they've paid the price somehow. And I'm not saying that that's happened every single time because there are times people have tried to mess with me and moved on. I had no idea what happened to them. Um, and then there have been people who have really been helpful to me. And I've seen them be blessed beyond measure. And it's, that's fascinating and interesting to me uh, that if someone tries to mess with me, whether it's through the business or whether it's in a work environment, I don't have to worry. I don't have to fight that battle with, with flesh. You know, there are spiritual tools we have at our disposal where we can fight that battle and trust in the most high. So, but yeah, to your point, a lot of, Corporate America is rooted in narcissism because it's almost like a caricature that executive, that CEO, that founder or whatever. And people want to emulate that person, even though that person may be the worst heathen in the world, but they're good at business. So therefore, people want to emulate them and follow them. And that becomes people's God, not the most high or keeping the commandments, but doing, following the tenets of that person. And of course, you know, if somebody's a narcissist and they're successful, you know what they inevitably all have to do. They all have to write a book, right? So then people start saying, did you read so-and-so's book? This is a great, you should read it. There was a uh, one woman who, and I didn't read the book and I forgot her name. She may have worked for Facebook or some other company, but 
she wrote this book called Lean Lean In, and it was primarily for women in corporate America. Basically, don't <laughs> you know if you if you decide you want to stay home, get married, have kids, raise your kids, and not have the world raise your kids, then you know maybe that's not the best course of action. The best course of action really is to lean in to that very uncomfortable thing that you are not really primarily wired for, and that is to be a corporate titan. You know, so again, these narcissists write these books because again, it's all about them and they've got all this great insight. Well, they've got great insight that is rooted in wickedness and people love that. So people, that's how people, a lot of people go astray, even so-called quote unquote Christians go astray because they put these people on pedestals and they don't realize, as you said earlier, that the scriptures are the quintessential instruction manual for disciples. Okay, everything we need to know about living our lives, whether it's work, whether it's elsewhere, whether it's at home, is in the scriptures. And people simply have to look at Daniel and Joseph, Daniel in Babylon and Joseph in Egypt. Egypt. How did they handle those wicked leaders? They didn't protest and say, we're going to try to take you down, etc., because they understood what their role was. And their role, first and foremost, is to serve the Most High. And Joseph knew that, hey, he's, he got sold into slavery and now he's in this situation after being in prison for, what was it, 10 years, that he's now in Potiphar's house. He's now, he's now in a very high place in Egypt to where he can help his family and then continue the Most High's objective and his will to bless Israel. And so... And, and Joseph was very obedient to that. He didn't get out of prison saying, you mother, I'm going to kill. I'm going to, you put me in prison. No, he's like, you know, giving all praises to the most High. I'm glad I'm out. And now here's my role in my life. And same thing with Daniel. He knew that again, Israel, because of Israel's wickedness, they've been taken captive in Babylon and how he dealt with Nebuchadnezzar. You know, he's like, you know, Oh King, Oh great King live forever when he's giving uh, an explanation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so that's an ideal model for us because we think that if somebody is in, in office, we have to protest or resist them. Or if, if we're working for a company, and I'm not saying that if there's wrongdoing and you can address it, you shouldn't address it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is for the most part, people get into these positions and they hate their jobs. They hate their bosses. They hate their company. They full of hate, 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 because they don't understand that the Most High has them wherever he has them for a reason for that season. And so even with that, we sometimes get into a little bit of narcissism because we think it's all about us and our comfort and our desires. And it's not. It's about where does the Most High have us to accomplish his will and to have us do things according to his will if we're able to hear it and if we're obedient to hear those things. But oftentimes we get caught up in this worldliness and it, you know, it takes us down to a path where we're just, we're no better than the heathen. You're absolutely right. And a lot of times, um, unfortunately, and it's with all of us and it's, it's, uh, I've heard the psychologists talk about this, that in order to survive in America, you have to have a little bit of narcissism in you just to survive mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Um, it, it comes with the territory. So, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. We have to be not full blown, just a little bit, just a little bit. But, you know, we we can set healthy boundaries for ourselves mm -hmm. with people because sometimes you have to be a little narcissistic in order to battle against the narcissist, believe it or not. And I know that from firsthand experience in the relationship I was in um, yeah. last year that I, yeah. towards the end of that relationship, to get out of it swiftly without being identified as what I was doing, I had to be narcissistic. <laughs> I had to be very deceptive in the way I move. So yeah. um, well, it's interesting. Know, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to take an opportunity, if, if you don't mind, to address what you said in terms of, um, you know, sometimes being narcissistic or having a balance. And I, I'm going to look at that as, being a good and 
wise and shrewd steward of what the Most High has given us. And I'll explain what I mean. So we're familiar with the parable of the talents. And that has application across many, many areas. And so one area is, you know, the Most High gives us talents to, well, for, for example, you've got a talent in what you do. And the Most High is giving you this talent and you're exercising your talent. You're making the most of it. You're not putting it under a bushel. You're not hiding it. You're not digging a hole in the ground and putting it under there saying, hey, I can do all this stuff, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Okay. And so he gives us these talents and he wants us to be good stewards of these talents and, and oftentimes be shrewd, which doesn't mean take advantage of people. It means being a good steward of what the Most High has given you. And so I, I would categorize Instead of us being partial narcissists, I would say that he's he's given us the ability to be wise and shrewd and good stewards of what he's given us. And similar to you with a person that I was with who was very narcissistic, meaning that, that person could not could never see anything that they did wrong. And they were always the victim and it was always about them, 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 them. And so what I had to do, similar to you, is I had to create a construct to protect myself in order that I could do X, Y, Z and, you know, move out and then create a structure where I protected myself because this person wanted, you know, half my income uh, unwarranted and uh, a lot of my possessions, et cetera. And so I'm not going to get into the details as to why um, that shouldn't have been the case and why that was wrong for that person to, want those things. It was completely wrong, but I'm not going to get into the details of that. But the point being that I had to be somewhat coy in what I was, the moves I was making in order to protect myself. Right. And so I would categorize that as being a uh, uh, shrewd and being a good steward and being wise. And so as opposed to being somewhat of a narcissist, I, I understand what you're saying, but there's, um, a, there's a description and a definition of what you were doing. And that's just being a good steward and being wise and, and being applying that wisdom to protect yourself, for example. So that's the way I would categorize it. Yeah. And it, it was, it was a matter of life or death in the way I had to move. It, it literally Absolutely. was. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so brother to seer, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think about all those board meetings and um, just overall <laughs> marketing meetings that I went to where when you were talking about earlier about how the narcissism, everybody's like, every all the higher ups is like, look at so-and-so, look at what they're doing. Hey, so-and-so, what are you doing to make your sales? What are you doing? Well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And, you know, yeah. people, uh, you just really got to, you got to really just work hard and you got to be obsessed and all this other mm -hmm. mumbo jumbo yeah. that I used to hear. Now, I didn't know what narcissism was at that time. I didn't know that mm -hmm. there was a word for it or anything, but boy, mm. that narcissism was, was thick in the air for yeah. those meetings. And I just remember yeah. always feeling like in my mind, I'm just like, this is a bunch of bullshit. Like we, mm -hmm. any person, and I'm not saying every single person, because I met some good people that were really good at sales mm -hmm. and marketing and stuff like that. But yeah. most of the time, when I would go out in the field with these top producers, which I wound mm -hmm. up becoming a top producer by being honest, mm -hmm. I was the guy that I was going to tell you everything that's in the small print that the company tells you not to focus on or even talk about. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to make that my focal point and make that my selling point to be like, here, I'm going to tell you everything you're getting yourself involved in. Mm -hmm. And if you ever have questions, I'm here for you. But right. I'm not going to lie to you to get the sale. But I right. remember being in meetings and going out with these people. Mm -hmm. And these people that were your top producers were mm -hmm. some of the most unethical people you can ever yeah. come across. And yeah. some of them were Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, yeah. I think I may have mentioned this to you in our conversation that I had a pastor, a female yeah. pastor of a Christian church in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. that was stealing business from me. Mm -hmm. I complained about it 
She was warned about it and she did it again. So mm. when people used to be like, oh, so-and-so is a Christian. I'm like, so what? <laughs> what the hell does that mean? <laughs> I don't care if she built the damn church. That don't yeah. mean a damn thing to me. I remember like I was so livid. Like I, I, I just was like, just because somebody professes and says out loud that I'm a follower of Christ, uh, mm -hmm. you know, God is good all the time, yeah. all that yeah. nonsense. It's like, and that's why I don't put too much stock in this name of the Most High, because I had a conversation with Akari about this. And when, mm -hmm. when the Most High spoke to Mo Moses, he don't have a name. He's like, yeah. I am what I am. Like, I, yeah. I am everything that is. How do you put a name on everything that is and ever will be? How do mm -hmm. you do that? It's impossible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, when it comes to like, like having this, like almost like immediate respect when somebody says, I give praise to the most high. It's like, mm -hmm. you better pump your brakes on that one mm -hmm. because... And this is just my perspective on things based on my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look for the fruits of their spirit. Yeah. Because that's really the only way if you're going to be able to identify if somebody truly loves the most high in Christ. Mm -hmm. It's not because they say so. Because right. I came from, uh, I call it a cult congregation, mm -hmm. <laughs> an online cult <laughs> congregation. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people saying, oh, I love Yahweh Elohim and, you know, uh, the Heavenly Father's Son and all that. But they, they, their fruits of the Spirit did not equate to, to what they were saying. And a lot of right. times it never does. And going back to this topic of conversation when it comes to um, capitalism and corporate America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very interesting to see how people will compromise their so-called spiritual belief systems in mm -hmm. order to put more money in their pocket. Yeah, yeah, and that's not just to put more money in their pocket. That's a that's a key element. That's a, by, a key byproduct of of what you've experienced. But it's to have sway over other men and women and to be viewed yes. a certain way because the right. way people are viewed is very very important. To, to some people. And so you, you mentioned something that I've experienced also, and that was, you know, you met, you saw it in sales. I saw it in marketing. And so I worked for a company. It was at the time it was a fortune 100 company and I was in the marketing department. And what we had was we were an internal marketing department, almost like an internal agency. And we had business units within our company. And each of us had two or three business units that we did the marketing for. And these business units are anywhere from $200 million in sales up to a billion dollars in sales. Okay. And so I'd go and I, you know, each of us would go and we would service our business units and we had, you know, print production capability in our department. We had, uh, we got, we could hire copywriters. Um, we worked with an ad agency, et cetera. So whenever we would have a weekly meeting, um, within our own internal department, and we would share what we're doing with our business units. It was it was something that was kind of a, a it was something that was a shock to me, but it was something that I had to get used to because I wasn't used to when it comes to when it comes time for me to talk about what I'm doing for my clients. You know, it's like jump on the table with pom poms and do a big cheer about hey, this is what I'm doing, and this is so great, and this is so wonderful. My colleagues were doing that. But I struggled with doing that. I would say, well, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Yep, we've made this progress, et cetera. But I wasn't a big, giant cheerleader. Now, granted, most of the people in the department were women. So maybe they were predisposed to doing that. But, um, and these were very capable women, too. So I'm not saying that, you know, they weren't capable. But um, I, I was, I, I had to learn how to, in the again, keeping in mind the environment that I'm in, not that I'm, buying into this whole narcissistic environment thing, but I had to understand the environment that I'm in. So I had to give and show my boss and his boss basically what they wanted to see. And that was, Hey, I'm excited that I'm doing good work for my clients. And that was pretty much the extent of it. So I learned to do that better, which was helpful for me because by the time I had my first business and I had to go sell my services, 
I'm not going to be subdued when it comes to, Hey, I can do this for your company. I can do that for you. I had to convince them that I had, I, I had the capability to do these things for their companies. So that was a learning experience for me, but I understand, and I've seen this over and over again, especially with marketers and communicators, because those are some of the self, most self-centered people in, in business and in corporate America, because I, I've sat around with people that work in government. I've sat around with, you know, accountants and finance people, and I've sat around with marketers and communicators and I've sat around with salespeople too. So the marketers and communicators, I've always said, if you go to a conference of accountants and finance people, they're going to be average looking people and they're going to be dressed average. And you may see one or two people who is really well put together. If you go to a conference of marketers and communicators, everybody's going to be a beautiful person. Okay. Almost everybody. And they're going to be dressed to the hilt. They're going to be wearing the nicest suits, the nicest outfits, the nicest pants, nicest shirts. And they're going to be well put together. Okay. Which is, yes. which is kind of funny. That is true. So, um, but yeah, it's, you know, it, it, we, we still have to navigate through these things. And the way I, the way I'm, look at it. And the thing that I mentioned to people is you have to understand the environment that you're in. And you, unless you're at heart an entrepreneur, you're going to go off and do your own thing where you are your boss. You have to really, if you want to put food on the table and you want to pay the mortgage, et cetera, you have to understand the environment that you're in and you have to behave and move accordingly. doesn't mean you have to be narcissist, but it means that if if there's a way that you have to present yourself or present the work that you're doing, you should do that. You know, not because you've sold out to the enemy or anything remotely close to that, but your job in the, in my company, my business, your business, it's a tool. And, you know, there, there's a scripture in Ecclesiastes about money being a defense. Wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. Okay. So these things are tools for us and, you have to make these things your tool. And so some people look for validation and peace, et cetera, through the nature of their jobs and what they do for a living. And that's a trap because our, our trust and our peace has to come from the most high. That being the case, we can go and do anything pretty much anywhere, you know, unless it's, you know, completely breaking the commandments or something. But if we've got a job and it's paying us a salary and, you know, whether we're making a lot or a little bit, Use that as a defense. Use that as a tool to do what the Most High wants you to do, whether it's in their in your job, whether it's in your church, whether it's in your family, your community, or what have you. Use it as a tool. It should not be the end-all, be-all of someone's life. And a lot of people make it the end-all, be-all, and they get their identity from their jobs or their businesses or whatever they do for a living. And if you were to take that away from them, what are they? they, they yes. It's like they're nothing. That's so, right. That's like yeah, when so you ask just, somebody who you are opposed to what you do, the yeah. answer to who you are is the answer to what they do. Right. Right. Exactly. And it's like, yeah, tell me about yourself. Well, I work for, I'm a doctor or I'm a lawyer or I do this, or, you know, and then a little down the road, they say, well, I'm married and I have kids, et cetera. But that often comes well after, you know, what you do for a living. And that's what people seem to get their self-worth from. So, uh, and look, we've all, to some degree, we've all been guilty of that. Okay. Right. Including myself, you know, it's like, uh, -huh, that's not who I am. Who am I really? You know, I have to look at it as, you know, if I'm serving the most high and I'm pursuing the most high and I desperately, desperately want to, um, try to be perfect as my father in heaven is perfect, then I'm going to be studying scriptures. I'm going to be looking at doing videos. I'm going to be looking at talking to my family members and people that I've known and gotten to know over the course of my adult life. And the way I see it, and I, I've had to be better at talking to people who are not in the truth, because when I first got in the truth, I'm like, can't you see this? This is so obvious. And it's like people, again, pe people are blinded and we have to right. allow the most high to work in them in order to um, uncover that blindness. And we may not see it. You know, we may just be plant planting seeds. But I, I equated it to you're on a train that's heading 120 miles an hour towards a cliff. Now, we don't know exactly when the cliff is going to appear. We're going to go down 
into the crevasse, okay? But we know that the train is heading 120 miles towards the cliff. And so all of us were on that train at one point or another. And by the grace of the most high, we got taken off that train. And so now you see other people, people you know and love, and you've, you've known all your life still on that train. And you want to shout out to them with a bullhorn, get off that train. That train is going down to the garage. It's going to kill you. And so part of us wants to be, part of us wants to desperately grab people off that train, but we can't. It's up to the most high whether that person gets off that train. And some people are going to get off the train, but unfortunately, most people are not. Okay. And so, and we don't know who will and who will not get off the train, who, who, or, who will or will not be pulled off the train by the most high. But it's not up to us. You know, should we plant seeds? Should we talk to them? Absolutely. If, if, the, if the opportunity presents itself, by all means, we, we have the responsibility to do that. But we can't pull anybody off the train that doesn't want to be pulled off the train. You know, even though we got pulled off the train and we understand where the train is headed. But given all praises to the most high, he, he pulled us off the train. And uh, before it went crashing down and, um, you know, Lord's will, he'll pull other people that we know and love off that train too. Yeah. Especially with the satanic serum, man. I keep going back to that because that was, <laughs> Oh man. You want to talk yeah. about like, that's, that's what I was doing with certain family members. I was trying to get them off the train. I was like, why are you going on the train? You haven't listened to my podcast. You heard my podcast. You heard what I've been saying on the podcast. How in yeah. the hell are you going on the damn train after I told you what's going to happen? And, yeah. you know, people like my brother, my oldest brother, oh, I want to fly. Mm -hmm. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like, hey, there's plenty of people flying that didn't do that. So why, yeah. you know, but it is what it yeah. is. You can't stop them, man. And that that's what I call the convincer. When I first came into the truth a long time ago, I was trying to convince everybody about mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. I was trying to convince people that they're a spiritual being having a physical experience opposed to the other way around. Mm -hmm. But you have to learn. The Most High will put you through certain things to bring you to an understanding that that's not your purpose. It's not right. so much that you have to convince people. Right. You, you become the example. Mm -hmm. And for those that are ready to receive the message through your example, through your interactions yeah. with them, will mm -hmm. be ready to receive it. Those that don't, that's not your responsibility. Absolutely, bro. And you, you hit on a very interesting point about trying to convince people of that issue. And it's a couple of brothers did a really good class a few months ago about the enemy's purpose of dividing and conquering. Okay. So using this issue as a wedge issue to create divides between family members, between um, husband and wife, between friends, et cetera, coworkers and what have you. And it's, it's insidious. It's, it's, and they hit the nail on the head and it, it made me realize, you know, number one, they were right. And then I had to look at what was going on with spiritual eyes with people that I knew. And, you know, I had people like, like you and like everybody else saying, you need to take this. Why aren't you taking it? And, you know, I, I, called myself trying to convince people or give an explanation why. And then I realized I don't, I don't have to give anybody an explanation about any of these, about any of this stuff. Right. If you want to do it and you've done your due diligence and your research, by all means, do what you think is the right thing to do. And, you know, and, and we see what's happening now. And I, I, I hope and pray. And I don't know whether it's in vain that, you know, people that I know and love will, will not suffer the same fate. But again, you you chose to do this. And the thing that is fascinating is, again, whether or not we decide to trust the most high or we trust in man. So we how many how how common has it been in the last 20, 30 years, specifically as we've been adults, that people will go into a grocery store and say, let me look at the ingredients and see what's in there, because you know, I don't want to consume high fructose corn syrup. Or I don't want to do this or this has too many preservatives in it. So I'm going to therefore blah, blah, blah. And some of those same people will say, I don't know what's in this thing, but I'm going to take it anyway. You know, which again is a bit of cognitive dissonance, but what it's rooted in, what it's truly rooted in, which is again, is, is, is an insidious plan of the enemy is to under, is to um, trap people who care about what other people think of them. And there are a lot of people who follow the crowd and a lot of people who are locked into this matrix system who think 
who believe that things are occurring by accident. It's just by chance. Uh, the things, the major things that we see happening in this world are, are all planned. Okay. They're not by accident. It's not like, oh, this happened. It was an accident. It was horrible. It, no, a lot of this stuff is planned. And so if we're not of the mind to realize that this world lieth in wickedness, and that's not, I mean, the most high is not a liar. And so if he says it is, then it is. It doesn't mean that, well, most of the world is Christian and there are a few bad players. No, it means the whole world lieth in wickedness. And so because of that, the love of many has already gone cold. You've got people literally murdering people around the world to get their end, either to sacrifice to their God or to basically get what they want. And, and that's been happening forever. But you see it in this world and it happens and the people say it doesn't happen. Okay. Or the media says it doesn't happen or the media ignores it. Okay. Because they're all part of the same system. Um, but you know, the, the, the purpose of that whole thing that everybody wanted you to take is to, is to, um, implement peer pressure to pressure you into doing something. So nobody would say you're causing all this stuff. You're a murderer if you don't get it. Because, you know, which we know now the opposite is true, that if you did get it, you were likely shedding and you were getting sick all the time and you were potentially um, passing oh. on to other people and making them sick. And there, brother there's Tassia, even... be careful with those with those words, brother. Oh, I'm and, sorry. Yeah, you said to... the S word. Just be careful. I'm just saying. Okay. No, I, I appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Thanks for the warning. So, yeah, um... because uh, I'm telling you the level of censorship these days is... It's boy, yeah. the enemy's working overtime. But go so ahead, I'll, continue. I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, impact it <laughs> the way people yeah. are impacted. Um, and so, but this is all is again insidious plan of the enemy to make it so that um, if they can't, if they're, if the marketing and communications and the promotion doesn't get people to do it, then their family and friends will get them to do it. Okay, because everybody wants to be. Um, everybody wants to be accepted. Nobody wants to be an outcast, right? Although the Most High said, if we're if we're the disciples of Christ, we're going to be a peculiar people anyway. So, but people don't want to be peculiar. People don't want to stand out or be made fun of or looked at as nerds or looked at as odd. But you know, that's that's one of the prices we have to pay if we decide to follow the Most High. I don't know if you can hear the uh, the yeah, landscaping what is that? Is in the that, background. Um, that's is that the landscaping. Mom yeah, that's the landscape over here every week, once a week. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop. I'm going to put my thing on mute. If you want to um, continue or comment on what I said. No, that's fine. Um, I was just laughing. Cause I'm like, Oh, you said the S word. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't think I'm going to, I don't think any censorship is going to come of that, but yeah. see, that's the thing is like, it, it's, uh, it, 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 they got it to where you you're up walking on eggshells, you know, and that's yeah. one of the things I don't like. But let's um let's go let's let's wrap things up. So um I want to bring up one last thing and get your uh, thoughts on this because I'm pretty sure you'll have some interesting things to say about this. But when it comes to economics, uh, the world economy. But let's focus on the United States and let's focus on narcissism when it comes to economics. And I'm, I'm going to make it real simple. When we had President Trump, okay, and you want to talk about narcissism and being the poster child, I mean, you couldn't have a better candidate than President Trump, right? I can't even believe that we're calling him President Trump. Like, who would have thought when we were watching Back to the Future, and seeing president, you know, as Trump being president, people are like, oh, 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 look at that. They think President Trump is going to be, he's going to be president in the future. It's like you were saying, all of this is planned. There's nothing by coincidence. And like the movie V says, and I love that statement, it says that the coincidence doesn't exist. Only the illusion of it. That is the only thing that's real is the illusion of coincidence, but it's not. It's more of a coincidence. But 
when it comes to economy, when it comes to this thing that you were breaking down so wonderfully about image, about people wanting to be seen a certain way, how most people don't want to be looked at as peculiar. Um, what do you think happened on why people, and, and I'll, I'll give you my opinion. I think a lot of the reasons why the country, when President Trump was in office, was getting worse and worse is because people want to not only trust in man and they venerate man all the time, but we're coming to a point now in society as a whole, especially in the United Shenanigans of America, that everybody now believes what somebody says if it sounds good to their ego. So when you have a guy that's like, I, I've had the most, I brought the most jobs out ever in the history of this country, um, the country's never been better. I'm going to make this country great again, even though this country's never been great. Um, what do you think is the psyche now, people, on how people have become so, I guess the word that I could think of is unspiritual. People are more cardinal now these days. Yeah. So it's one yeah. of those things where people are a lot less spiritual these days, even though they're still yeah. spiritual beings having a physical experience. But why do you think people just believe what's good that sounds good in their ears? Like, they just, you have a man that literally lies on stage with some of the most obscene type of rhetoric, lies, and you're just like, people are eating this shit up. How is that even possible? But the scriptures talks about how in these days and time, um, which is my favorite scripture in the book of Isaiah, which is uh, Isaiah chapter five, verse 20, where they've accepted the darkness for the light and the light for the darkness, right? We're seeing that more and more now. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that people so willingly believe a lot of the shenanigans that are narcissists of the world are, are telling people? Yeah, so um, that is a good question. The answer is manifold. It's it's an overarching big answer, and it, I'm going to start this by saying, so I, I've been, you know, at my age, I've experienced a number of presidential campaigns, and I actually have a book that, uh, and I, I've, I I see politics now as more of a sport than something to really quote unquote, believe in uh, the, the politics is like the NFL. Okay. So the NFL, you have, um, you know, whether it's the Packers against the, the bears or the Redskins against the Cowboys and Cowboys fans hate Redskins fans and Redskins fans hate Cowboys fans. It's like almost like at each other's throats, but it all comes under the auspices of the NFL. Okay. So, and the, these rivalries are scripted. Okay. In other words, yeah, it's a rivalry, but the NFL is in business to entertain. It's not to provide fair competition. And people think it's it's all fair happenstance, right. coincidence. A lot of these things are scripted. So they already know who's going to be in the Super Bowl, et cetera. And they already know the storylines because you can control it by the referees and by select players. So there are referees and select players who are charged with missing a tackle or not catching a ball or doing something because it's, it's scripted. It's sort of like pro wrestling. Okay. Well, that's Except, what I call politics, the WWE. That's how I yes. reference it all the time. Exactly. And so having looked and watched and observed and also studied presidential campaigns. So what we saw with Trump has been presented as this is so out of the ordinary, somebody who, was not in politics. And I, if you look back, there are, there are a number of interviews that he did, even when Oprah had her show. I remember there was, you can see these things on, you, on YouTube. Oprah had a show and Donald Trump is being interviewed because he's a guest. And she's saying, well, these things that you're talking about seem like presidential talk. And he's like, oh, I don't know if I want to do it because I have a good life and it's a mean life politics. I said, I don't know if I want to do it. So here we are. Fast forward to 2016. He's won, et cetera. And so it's important for us to understand this environment that we live in because we live in a matrix. Okay. Right. And this matrix we live in 
it's not a case where every presidential campaign, every president has been great. And then we got to Trump and that's the one who's been bad. Yeah. They've all been bad. They, they are all the basis of men as, as the scriptures say, and the most high decides who's going to be in office and who's not going to be in office. Okay. So I ask people, you know, there, there is a scripture in Daniel where, um, it says the most high is the one he, he puts people in place and he removes people. Um, and it's up to him. And I've asked people, I said, so with that understanding, and we can even go back to, um, the scriptures where the most high told the prophets in Israel, I'm, I've given all these lands to Nebuchadnezzar. So I want you to not resist him and you'll still be taken in captivity, but Israel and Jerusalem is not going to be destroyed. Okay. The temple is not going to be destroyed. But if you try to resist them, then it's going to go bad for you. So what did Israel do? Try to resist. <laughs> and it went bad for them. Temple was destroyed. More people were taken captive into Babylon. Okay, so what does that mean? That means regardless of what Israel wanted or tried to do, the Most High's way is going to be done regardless. Okay, so he put Nebuchadnezzar in place for his purposes and his purposes only. And Israel had to get on board with that. Okay, so fast forward to where we are now. And I asked people, I said, with that in mind, is voting important? And that kind of stumps people. They're like, well, some people have said, well, he puts kings and other people in place, but he leaves, you know, presidents and Congress to, to, for us. Now, there's no scripture that says that. <laughs> right? This person is just making that up. OK, but case case in point being. If Donald Trump didn't, wasn't supposed to be in office, if the Most High didn't want him in office, he wouldn't have been in office. If the Most High didn't want Biden to be the puppet president, he wouldn't put him in, in office. Okay, so all these things are happening as the Most High continues to um, meet out his purpose. Okay, and so right. he's got a purpose that and we don't have the, we, we understand what Christ told us and what the prophets told us in terms of what's going to happen, but we don't know exactly how everything's going to fold, uh, unfold. So because of that, we have, we really should, if we're being honest with ourselves, we have to look at every president, especially in our lifetime, every president going back from, you know, Biden to Trump to Obama and I know people love Obama, but again, it is what it is. Going back to second Bush, going back to Clinton, going back to the first Bush, going back to Reagan also. And we people think that, oh my goodness, Reagan was the best president in the world. Now, granted, as a business owner, there are things that I like that certain administrations have done because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business owner. That doesn't mean that these people are the greatest in sliced bread. OK, right. it just means that there are some things that some administrations are going to do that people like people. Some people are going to like what Obama did and what Clinton did and what Biden is doing. Some people are going to like what um, Trump did and what Reagan did. OK, going again, going back to Jimmy Carter, going back to Ford, going back to Nixon, going back to um, Johnson and Kennedy, et cetera. OK, so. All of these people are put in place because the most high wants them in place for whatever reason. Okay. And so is Donald Trump a narcissist? Absolutely. Are other presidents, have other presidents been narcissists? Yes. You sort of have to be one in yes. order to get into that grind. Okay. Right. So in order for you to go on the campaign trail, even if it's predetermined and it's fixed, you still have to go through the machinations. Okay. You still have to go on the campaign trail. But some people now we're seeing that some people can just be in their basement and still win an election and never debate or never do anything because a lot of this stuff is, is manufactured and fixed. So, um, so I think what you, what you suggested and what you mentioned is nothing new. It, as we said, there's nothing new under the sun. So these things have been happening for a while. And you look at the people who loved Obama, we're like, oh my goodness, there's a black president now because that's the most important thing is that we have a black president, right? That solves every issue, right? And so people looked at it that way. That now that Obama <laughs> is president, it solves every issue. It's like, no, it doesn't. Brother, and can I say know, something to you real quick about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I was very well aware that presidents are selected, not elected, when Obama mm -hmm. became president. Yeah, yeah. But being a man of so-called color, 
And being a man mm-hmm. that's been oppressed by police in New York City, uh, been oppressed pretty much most places I go to, not just mm-hmm. because of my ethnicity, but it's more because of my spirit. And when you mentioned that earlier about certain people just noticing something in your spirit and things are not going to yeah. click between you. But when yeah. he did his speech when he first won, when he came out and everybody, mm-hmm. and he started talking I was on the phone with my current, or not my current, but my girlfriend at that time. Mm-hmm. And I, a tear came to my eye, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, was actually all, like, welling up, huh? <laughs> I started to cry. And, and oh, it's just man. crazy because I'm like, I know what this man represents. I know where he comes from. But it's that, and I've talked about it with many people on my show. It's like, you've gone through so much oppression that psychologically, it's like, that's how they get you is through that emotion. So I did get a little emotional to see a melanated man on that podium. I did. It it affected me a little bit. I mean, it wasn't heavy. I wasn't like, I wasn't like Jesse Jackson. (laughs) But <laughs> or some of the news uh, news anchors, right? Yeah, I wasn't <laughs> like that. But a tear came to my eye because it it just it it felt good to see it, just to see it yeah. one time. You know what I mean? And, and I I understand that, bro. And that's one of the reasons why they did it is because they know that right. people are going to emotionally, it's going to re- resonate with people emotionally. And you know, now granted, if anyone does any cursory investigating about or investigation about any candidate or president, you'll you'll see what their background really, their background will tell you a number of things that most people don't know. And most, you know, you do one on that president and you'll see that he is likely an asset of a particular three letter agency and has been groomed that way since, since he was young. And so he, he was in the pipeline and next thing you know, he, now he's president. Okay, so again, there's nothing new under the sun um, selected is, is right. And, um, it's because we live in a matrix and it, none of this stuff is real. And so these things are, I, I realized a long time ago, back in the nineties, because I was a staunch conservative, you know, and there are people that I voted for, which a lot of people of our color would say, oh, I don't believe you voted for this person. Somebody said, well, well, something about when you voted for Obama, I said, I didn't vote for Obama. Oh my goodness, you voted for John McCain. Why? I, I said, I didn't say I voted for John McCain. And so, but that person could not fathom the fact that a person of their same persuasion did not vote for the only melanated president, supposedly, um, who, who had a chance to win. Because people look at it as, I'm going to choose my own color, my own skin tone as opposed to their character or what they stand for, what, what, whether their beliefs align with mine, et cetera. So, um, but there is no candidate who, who aligns with the most high. They're all wicked. Okay. It's not just Trump, even though, do I, did I like some things Trump did? Absolutely. As a business owner, absolutely. I would rather pay less in taxes than more. And I, I admit that, especially as a business owner. Um, do I want more of the government out of my life? Absolutely. You know, do most people? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, or do some people, I should say it that way. Do some people? Yeah. Now, do some people want more intervention from the government? Absolutely. So therefore you, you have this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it's like the NFL. It's like sometimes the Cowboys win, sometimes the Redskins win. But when you win, sometimes you think you have a chance. <laughs> and so... That's what you see going on in politics is you see some people are like, okay, now it's our time, you know? Oh yeah. And then when somebody else gets elected, it's like, okay, now it's our time. When you don't realize that you're a frog in a pan and the heat's being turned up slowly, but you're looking at your team and decide that you want it to win. And that's the issue is that politics is, you know, going back to one of the earlier point that you were making that, you know, we get caught up in this and, People want their side to win. Okay. So when people look at politics, they'll ignore certain things. Like some people will say, I would never be a proponent of abortion or, or, you know, uh, maybe I should say another word to, to evade the censors, but nobody wants to have 
the thing growing in them removed. Okay. I would never support that, but they vote for people that support that. And then you ask them why they vote for people that support that. If they don't, well, they do other things that I like. Okay, great. So you compromise. Everybody compromises when they decide, okay, I'm going to support this one. I'm going to support that one because nobody's going to meet every criteria that people have. But if you look at what do the commandments tell us to do, what's important to the most high, no, no candidate meets that. Not Trump, not Obama, not Clinton, not Bush. Nobody does. So as the scriptures say, it's the basis of men who are going to rule over us. It, that's exactly what it is. These are not the best people that you could possibly have. The best people don't want to get into politics because it's a grind. It's, it's horrible. It's terrible. And so you have people who are narcissists people who want to be viewed, people who want attention and people who think, Hey, I've got skills that nobody else has. And I could do X, Y, Z. They're the people that get into politics or are recruited to be into politics, who are recruited to be in politics because now you have people, you have organizations and uh, different people recruiting senators, people who run for Congress, people who run for president, et cetera. You rarely have somebody saying, you know what, this is just terrible. I'm just going to run because I just think it's wrong. I just think so many things are wrong. If you ever had that candidate, that candidate is not going to make it out of the primaries. Okay. So it is what it is. And so people who are elected or selected, they are the basis of men. They don't have these uber redeeming qualities. They're not keeping the commandments. They're not following the most high, but we have to live in this world. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to resist and resist and protest, et cetera. There's a scripture that I, I, don't have in front of me now, but it talks about the people that are put in place of you in, in rulership over you. You're not, we're not supposed to spend our time protesting against that because the most high put that in place. And so we, if we do that, we're doing it to our own detriment. And so, but what did we see? What do we see now with Biden? You know, we have the, the chant <laughs> that is very popular about let's go, Brandon, you know, we have that and that's chanted all over the world. It's funny to a lot of people, but then, you know, when Trump was in office, you had resist. And so everybody's like, we got to resist this president. He's an illegitimate president. And then before him, he had people who didn't like Obama either because of his skin color or because of his policies or what have you. And they were like, he's a liar, et cetera. And then you had people who were defending him. Uh, and then even before that, you know, you had Bush who got us into these wars, which they were all pre preplanned anyway, and so on and so forth. And so you can go back to every president and say, well, here's, you can go back to, to Woodrow Wilson getting us, getting America into World War I. You can go back to Roosevelt getting America into World War II. So it's, it's ongoing. There is no president, nor will there ever be a president that people can look to and say, Oh my goodness, there, this is the per person we needed. Now, you're going to have a lot of people in, our, in this society, in this country, who are going to look at candidates or presidents and say, they've been the best one I've ever had. They've been the best president I've ever had. They've been the best vice president. They've done this. They were so wonderful. But again, that's by the world standards. And so that should not be our, that can't be our standard, is to look at these people in office who all of them are narcissists, all of them. We can't look at them and say, you know, we, we like them. We aspire to be like them. Someone asked me a question a while ago. So there's, there's one person that I talk politics with, no holds barred. I don't, I don't do that with most people because most people can't handle conversations like that. And people get upset and feelings hurt, et cetera. Not that I'm, in, not that I'm insulting people, I'm just bringing out the truth. So anyway, but there's one person that I speak to on a regular basis who I can have a conversation with this person and we're still, we still love each other. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's pretty good exercise to bring about specific truths and to bring about certain things. And, um, this person asked me, he said, well, do you admire this person or do you admire that person? And I said, I don't know them. How can I admire them if I don't know them? The only thing I know about them is what we're being fed about them, where we're being told about them. I've never met them. haven't spent any time with them. We're not buds. We don't talk on the phone. So how can I admire anyone that I don't know? And that goes with celebrities. That goes with sport fits, sports figures. That goes with politicians. We don't know these people. So how can we admire them? Now we could say, hey, they've done something that's very interesting. And you could say that that's interesting, but you don't know them. And so how can you admire somebody that you don't know? And so 
point being that politics, sports, entertainment feeds off of this, off of people who want to admire somebody, who want to see somebody succeed or want to glom on to somebody's success. And, you know, people have asked me, well, you're a business owner. You've, you know, you must have had many mentors. And my answer is always my biggest primary mentor by far was my father. And he was an entrepreneur. You know, he worked, but he also had a side business. And he was an entrepreneur. And he he was my primary and sometimes really only mentor because he taught me how to be a man. You know, he, I saw, I observed him and he was a good looking guy. And I've never seen him once flirt with a woman. So, and my mother appreciated that. All of us kids appreciated that. And there were women who would, I wouldn't say they would throw themselves at him, but there are stories that my siblings and I talk about where like there was a neighbor who almost threw herself at him. And, uh, you know, my mother had to put her in her place, but my father was a good looking dude. And so, but I've seen him be a father, a provider, a husband. And um, as he got older, our relationship got better and better and better. And, you know, he's gone now, but I, I wish I still had him to talk to, but he's been my primary mentor. And not that he taught me everything about everything, but he taught me what it is to be a man and to, and to have integrity and to operate and move with integrity, which really led me to pursuing the most high on my own. So, but going back to your original point, every, every president's a narcissist. There is one that's not. Um, people who would say, you know, Trump is bad and horrible and a narcissist and is really bad. Everybody else has been bad. It's just everybody's perspective is slightly different. So some people may say, no, Trump is worse than this. And some people may say Obama is worse than this. Everybody's perspective is different, but they all believe they all believe, belong in the same bucket. So that's, that's right. the important thing that we as disciples of Christ have to realize they all believe they don't they don't love us. <laughs> you know, they well, don't care about that's us. That's the thing. Many of our presidents have been covert narcissists, whereas mm -hmm. Trump is that grandiose, malignant one that's just like wants everybody to know how great he is. Um, hmm. You know, what's interesting, I was just seeing a poll where they, now that the the primaries are drawing near, mm -hmm. that they're asking people who they want to run for Democrat, who they want to run for Republican. So you still got a few people that are looking forward to Trump getting back in the race. Mm -hmm. uh, you got a lot of people that are interested in DeSantis running, which I think mm -hmm. he's the best governor ever <laughs> for me. <laughs> Um, I just as love. a Floridian, yeah. So, yep. yep. I was like, I don't want him to run for president. I just want him to stay governor. But uh, yeah. then you have people that on the Democrat side don't want Biden to run again. Obviously, for so many mm. obvious reasons. Yeah, well, I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. Um, you got some people that really don't want Kamala Harris. But what the overall attitude towards government right now with mm. both sides. Mm -hmm. is they don't even know what to think anymore as far as who mm -hmm. they want or even if there should be a president, which I find that very interesting because now people are finally waking up. And yeah. that's the that's the that's the power of the most high where people are finally starting to realize this is football. This is WWE. This mm -hmm. ain't real. So yeah. why should I even care about it? Why does it even need to exist? And that's what's happening right now. And that cognitive distance is kicking in too, to where it's like, they are starting to feel these feelings, but the ego's battling. Like, no, we need a government. And it's like, no, you don't. What have they done for you? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But bought you more misery and, yeah. and, and struggle and heartache. Yeah. yeah. So I just find that very interesting. I just saw that poll yesterday. I was mm. seeing it on, um, on Fox News. Where they were yeah, interviewing, yeah. you know, people from like the ages of uh, 25 to 45. Right. And, and this was the responses. Yeah. And I think, you know, for, again, the, the world is going to be the world. And um, we're always going to have, in, until the most high puts an end to it, we're going to have people running for office. We're going to have corruption. We're going to have all right. these things in place. And our role as disciples of Christ is to 
obey the Most High through Christ. And that doesn't mean trying to overthrow anything. It doesn't mean that we have to start all these protests. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that we are supposed to serve the Most High and we're supposed to, you know, try to live peaceably with with everybody if we can. Um, Now, there may be times when we can't for whatever reason, but if we can, that's what we're supposed to try to do. And this is not, I, I tell people, this is not our fight. This is their fight. And if we read in Revelation what's supposed to happen, we know that the Most High is is, has dealt and is dealing with his people. And then once he's done dealing with his people, he's going to deal with everybody else. And the everybody else is not going to like it. And so, but, you know, hopefully, Lord's will, we have ears to hear and in eyes to see and to understand what's going on by reading and studying the scriptures and to be ready for what happens next. You know, we talk about, you know, the, the thing, the thing that everybody wants everybody to take, you know, there may be some, uh, some other things coming down the pike. And so what are, how are we going to prepare for that? We could be preppers, you know, we could go live in a cave somewhere, but I don't think that's what the most high is calling us to do. No, I think he's calling us to, have faith and then stand on our faith. And if we really trust the most high and we believe that he's telling the truth, then he's going to do what he's going to do. He's going to do what he promised he's going to do. And he's, he's promised he's going to take care of his people. He's not going to leave or abandon us. Does that mean that we won't face some hardship? No, that, that's not what that means. But that means ultimately, because as you mentioned earlier, we are spirits that this life is extremely temporary extremely temporary. And if we had real vision to see how long eternity is compared to this life, we'd go, how foolish are we to put all our eggs in that one short breath of a life as opposed to all of eternity. And so we just have to be prepared here and physically as much as we, as much as makes sense, you know, but really we just have to be prepared in our mind and our heart to, to continue to serve the most high and all this other stuff that the heathen in the world is doing, let them do it because they're going to do it anyway, as long as the Most High allows it to happen. But I, I'm, I'm putting my trust and we should put our trust in the Most High through Christ. Well said, brother. So with that being said, we just went over two hours, but you know, like I told you, we once I edit everything on the back end, it'll be shorter. But um, mm-hmm. I just saw the post where to, today is Dewad's birthday. So I'm going to wish him a yeah. happy birthday. And uh, Absolutely. We're supposed to get up next week, so maybe we, him and I can kind of do a little uh, joint birthday celebrations <laughs> nice. for nice. this That'd month. So many birthdays in the month of January. Um, I, yeah, quite a few. Right? Um, but mm-hmm. with that being said, brother, um, let's wrap it up. Uh, any final comments? And also plug the people into your business. Let them know where they can reach you and all that good stuff. Let them know what you got going on. Yeah, it's uh, well, first of all, thank you for for the platform. I really, I really enjoyed our conversation. And um, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's a great platform to cover a lot of topics. And you and I have talked about this before, where there are a lot of topics that are uh, where, you know, the, the, the structure may be spiritually inclined. And then there are other topics that are still spiritually inclined, but they touch on a number of popular culture things that we find in this society. So I, I appreciate the, uh, the platform and I, I hope we can do it some more. Um, and so in terms of my business, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't usually tell people in, in certain platforms because it's, it's a B2B business and it's my, my clients are other companies. My clients are primarily large companies. Okay. And so that deal in certain areas of finance. Um, and so what I will say is this, I will say that um, sometimes I do help people um, who are entrepreneurs who are starting their own business. And um, even though my forte is primarily marketing communications, you know, this is my second business and I've read a lot of books and I, you can see a lot of books on my shelf. A lot of them have to do with business entrepreneur planning um, branding and a few other things. And so I will say that if anybody is interested in, um, in getting some feedback or some insight as to their entrepreneurial goals, they can 
reach out to me. And I, I'm going to say that, is there a way for them to reach out to me directly through, through you at all? Um, what do you mean through me? So if they're looking at your video, okay, whether they're live or whether it's the recording, can people comment on it, for example? Well, yeah, I do have a, a chat room on Spreaker, but people can leave comments or usually what I do is mo most of the time people will email me directly to or at networkofawareness.com. Okay. So anybody that's so, interested in your services, you can drop your email right now and I okay. can put it in the description box uh, as far as your contact information. If people okay. want to contact you, because I'm definitely going to be asking you for advice on how I can grow my influence, not just not with the podcast specifically, but overall making this podcast grow as a business when right, it comes right. to uh, marketing, because I want right. to get sponsors again um, and I want to, you know, get these commercials. But in order for me to do that, I still have to increase my listenership. Right. Yeah. So the, the email that I would give people is, and this is an email that I give, you know, just anybody, um, if they want to ask questions or if they, they want me to re reach out to them, you can use the email William Romeo. This is a strange email address, but William Romeo, R O M E O sounds like Romeo, but it's Romeo seven, 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 six at Gmail. So that's the email. That's the best email for anybody listening to the podcast. If they want to pick my brain about stuff or they want some insight or some uh, suggestions about their entrepreneurial dreams, feel free to reach out to me and, um, you know, hopefully we can, we can chat about it. And can you repeat that email one more time? You said William Romeo. William Romeo and Romeo is spelled like Romeo. Okay. And then seven, seven, seven six at gmail.com all right i'll make sure to put that inside the uh, description box okay okay and uh any anything else any final comments before we close things out <laughs> oh, bro, you, <laughs> i uh I, I sort of already gave uh, my final thought before, but I, but like I said, I can go on for hours about this, yeah. about these topics. So, okay. but no, I, I, we, we've covered a lot of ground and I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these things on your platform. And it won't be the last. So, and with some so of the things well. that we're going to be coming up, you and I will be able mm -hmm. to do our more spiritual sessions on a different platform. And then yep. we can talk about society, culture, and, yep. And this matrix on the network of awareness. Yep, so with that being bro, said, brother, well. um, most high Christ bless you as well. Um, okay, most. um I'm gonna close things out because um okay. you you've given a wealth of information and perspective on mm -hmm. this matrix and how things really work. So I hope that yeah. those people are listening have gotten great substance from this. I know I have. And uh let's close things out here. So thank you right, again, thanks. Tassir. And by the way, can you let people know what the what the Hebrew name Tassir means? Um, I believe it means ambassador. So uh, maybe that coincides with the fact that I'll talk to anybody about Christ and about what he's done for us, regardless of skin color or what, what, what supposed nation they're from. So I think that's that's the reason or that's the uh, the the background of that particular name. Okay, great. So, with that being said, brothers and sisters, I um, want to thank you for tuning in to this episode, um, which is uh, season five, episode 45. And this episode is, um, it's all about, you know, we talked about a lot of things, but uh, this episode was all about, you know, the world economic systems and how they're rooted in wickedness. So I hope that you got great substance, brothers and sisters. And like I always say, don't look for the light at the end of the tunnel because the light is and always will be within you. So light up the tunnel and find your way through the darkness. And when you live in the presence of the Most High and in Christ and you live that life, there is always an opportunity for a new beginning for you to begin that righteous life if you seek and desire it. 
through the grace of the Most High, all things are possible. So, shalom, barakatah, peace and blessings. Peace, love and light, brothers and sisters.